Today's episode is brought to you by Crossout. To some, she has wandered the earth realm for thousands of years, lurking under the cover of darkness and preying on infants for which to consume. To others, she is a temptress, a wicked femme fatale who seduces the unsuspecting man in the nocturnal hours. The Mesopotamians said she was a winged creature, perhaps part bird and part woman, one who possessed a horrific speech and a pair of bloody talons to boot. Meanwhile, various translations of the Bible, including the Derby translation, describe her as residing in the desolate place of Edom, amongst wildcats and hyenas, a hunting ground, perhaps. Various audiences have since described her as evil, innocent, immoral, brave, sickening, charming, villainous, heroic. Indeed, the character Lilith evokes many polarizing perspectives, and it would appear that throughout the generations of history, the meaning of Lilith has morphed to suit her ever-changing audiences. Going by the last episodes, we now have a fair understanding of the Mesopotamian attitude towards Lilith, which is arguably the oldest attitude that one could possibly have. But additionally, we also have a biblical attitude, at least as far as the Derby translation goes, as to who Lilith was and how she was regarded. She was not seen favourably in any capacity, and most communities would sooner ward their houses against her with talismans and incantations than risk her looming in their doorway. Appearing sometimes as a screeching owl in more traditional translations of the Bible, it appears that if Lilith was a creature that prowled in the night, she was eagerly overlooked and shunned. Even in the Greek Septuagint was she banished from the pages and detailed as another creature, the Onocentaur. To the Babylonians, Lilith had a pretty terrible rap sheet. She was a night spirit who preyed on the vulnerable, most notably pregnant women and children, and besides feasting on the flesh of babies and drinking their blood, she was also known to carry and spread disease. She seduced unsuspecting men in their beds, sometimes at the command of the Babylonian goddess Ishtar, and sometimes on her own accord. Some state that she took the role of a succubus, emptying men of their seed to fertilize her own offspring. Others say she seduced men for sport and defiled them in the process. But it wasn't until the 17th century do we get a new attitude towards Lilith, one that sees the unsavory demoness evolve into a more independent and complex character that remains to be a figure of contention as either the first wife of Adam or the mother of all demons. But before we get started on today's episode, a brief message from the sponsor of today's video, Crossout. Crossout is an online vehicle shooter where players can craft their own machines of death for use in battle. Play against others in fast-paced PvP encounters where you can test the metal of your own creation and determine which vehicular beast is the best. Team up with your friends and compete in in-game raids in spectacular PvE modes that see you and your team pitted against waves of challenging AI-controlled raiders. Or chill out with the more creative modes that the game has to offer, including vehicular football. One of the most interesting things about Crossout is the ability to craft a vehicle from scratch using individual parts. There's so much variation to choose from, including shotguns, auto cannons, railguns, chainsaws, explosive lances, rocket boosters and stealth generators that the combinations of what you can come up with are almost endless. My favourite thing about Crossout is probably how cool some of the designs look. Take the Arachnida for example, a vehicle built like a scorpion and equipped with turrets, high calibre bolt rifles and a holographic stinger. All in-game vehicles are fully customizable, and endless fun can be had from tweaking your ride to be as fast or deadly or stylish as you wish. Crossout is free to play on PC, PS5 and Xbox Series XS. Just use my download link here on screen or click the link in the description below to access the game and an exclusive bonus. And now back to Lilith. It wasn't until the 17th century do we see Lilith evolve into a more complex figure, one that wasn't just a demonic she-beast that terrorised infants and pregnant women, or who violated sleeping men. According to the alphabet of Ben Sira, 
an anonymous text comprising of a compilation of several proverbs, and an accompanying commentary, Lilith wasn't just a tantalizing temptress, or a nocturnal nemesis. She was in actuality the first wife of Adam. The tale of the alphabet is shown to us through the eyes of a courtier named Ben Sira, who was believed to be the son of Jeremiah. So renowned was Ben Sira that the king Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon wished to meet with him in the hopes that he would heal his sick son. When Ben arrived, the king threatened him and told him that if he was unable to heal his sick son, he would kill him. So Ben set to work fashioning amulets and inscribed on them the names of the angels and the animals, those that would go a long way in banishing the sickness of the king's young son. Upon seeing these amulets, the king was intrigued and asked Ben to explain what their function was and who the angels inscribed upon them were. With this, Ben begins his explanation as to how these very amulets were created, what their purpose was, and how Lilith was responsible for their necessity. We are told by Ben Sira a familiar version of the creation story, where God creates Adam, who was alone in the Garden of Eden. Believing man should have a companion, God also created woman, though this was not Eve constructed from Adam's rib, but instead Lilith, who was born from the earth, the same way Adam was. Unlike his marriage with Eve, Adam clashed with Lilith from the very get-go. Some might say she was the antithesis of a more passive Eve, a wildcat that had rebelled against Adam and challenged his very being. Specifically, one of their main quarrels appears to have been in regards to sex, for neither wished to lay beneath the other. Lilith believed that she was equal to Adam, given that they had both been made from the earth, and that because of this, she shouldn't have had to assume the bottom position during intercourse. Adam of course disagreed, and the two were never able to come to a compromise. To say that they were incompatible would be an understatement. The arguments between them grew so intense that Lilith reached her breaking point. She was said to utter the ineffable name of God, and with that, she took to the skies, apparently having gained the ability to fly, and abandoned the Garden of Eden, leaving Adam on his lonesome once more. Now Adam was still irked by Lilith's refusal to lie beneath him, and so he went to God and told him that Lilith had flown from the Garden of Eden. Immediately, God sent three of his angels to bring her back, before telling Adam that if she willingly returned, then all would be forgiven. But if she did not, then she would have to permit 100 of her children to die every day. This is where the text in regards to Lilith becomes somewhat tricky to understand. God appears to recognize Lilith as a mother in this section, one who is eternally pregnant and one who gives birth daily to hundreds of children. It is not specified whether God created Lilith to be this mass producer, whether these children were Adams or whether these children were even human. Some believe that after uttering God's name, she had damned herself, which is what caused her to grow wings and fly from the garden, perhaps turning herself into a demon. The hatred she felt for Adam and man in those moments in the garden was perhaps so palpable that it was able to manifest in herself, transforming her into the beastly and evil Lilith that's more in tune with the Babylonian account and Isaiah's account. Another idea is that by uttering the Lord's name, she had committed a grievous sin that was automatically punishable, where she was stripped of her humanity and given a more demonic visage. Given that she is suddenly deemed by God to give birth to hundreds of children a day, it might be said that after leaving the Garden of Eden, she became the Mother of Demons, a dark being who gave birth to all the ill intent she felt towards Adam and God in the form of demons. The three angels sent out by God eventually find Lilith in the midst of the Red Sea. When they beckon her to return, Lilith refuses, even after the angels threaten to drown her. It is unclear where she gains the following knowledge, or whether this is more of just an emotional outburst, but she tells the angels that, I was created only to cause sickness to infants. If the infant is male, I have dominion over him for eight days after his birth, and if female, for 20 days. In previous accounts of Lilith, 
we saw her flee to the desert or to the desolate wilderness untamed by man. By this account, we see her flee to the Red Sea, a place where ironically, the ancient Israelites achieved freedom from the Egyptians. It's quite fitting then that Lilith is able to achieve freedom from Adam in this same space, and that though she is chased by the angels, she denies them, perhaps almost mirroring how Moses had once denied the Pharaoh's pursuit by crushing him and his men with the rising waters. But the ancient Israelites fleeing to the Red Sea was seen as a triumph and a cause for celebration. Lilith's escape on the other hand appears to be seen as a defeat, a loss of paradise, and a complete isolation of herself. She appears resentful and dismayed when she recounts to the angels that she was made only to cause sickness to infants, but evidently to her, such a fate is more appealing than spending any more time with Adam, even if this is in paradise. Another idea suggests that causing sickness to infants was not a role given to her by God for her sin, but instead a path of her own choosing, to spite Adam for his mistreatment and to spite God for giving her an ultimatum. When the angels hear Lilith's words, they continue to make demands of her to return to Eden. But Lilith appears to strike a deal with the angels, telling them that, Whenever I see you or your names or your forms in an amulet, I will have no power over that infant. She also agrees to allow 100 of her children to die every day, as God had decreed. With this, every day, 100 demons, which are thought to be her children, perish. And for this reason, the names of the angels are written on amulets to protect young children. Whenever Lilith sees such an amulet, she is believed to remember her oath, and spares the child protected by such a talisman. The identity of the three angels in question here are not well known, though it is believed that they were angels of healing, and that their names were Sinoi, Sansanoi, and Samangelov. It is these names and angels that Ben Sira has on his amulets, for which he uses in the healing of King Nebuchadnezzar's son. It's noteworthy that Lilith is able to strike up a deal with the angels at all, for it is something that she suggests, and not God. You might say that Lilith is shrewd enough to bargain for her life, and while she recognises that she cannot hope to fight against the angels who have come for her, she is capable of diplomacy. This may hint further at the incompatibility of herself and Adam, in that neither is able to come to any middle ground. Even God is able to reconcile his differences with Lilith, and though he does destroy a hundred of her children every day, he does not destroy her. The conflict between Adam and Lilith therefore is quite striking. It is, by some interpretation, the struggle between patriarchal authority against matriarchal freedom, two sides that seemingly cannot correlate peacefully. One wishes to dominate the other, and one wishes to be free of said domination. In the end, the struggle is only intensified, and in this instance, it is the feminine desire for freedom which wins, for Lilith is emancipated, though arguably at a terrible cost. Lilith is forced to a hard and lonely life outside the comforts of the garden, and as if that wasn't enough, she is forced to witness the death of a hundred of her children every day. She might have her freedom, yes, but one might say that she, as a person, had to change into something more monstrous in order to earn it. However, Adam is just as equally spoiled in his defeat, for though he does remain in paradise, and though he does obtain a new subservient wife in Eve, he is eventually cast out from paradise, and forced to struggle on earth. By taking fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you might say that man became something monstrous too, and suffered a fate just as unkind as Lilith's. Going a step further, you might say that neither Adam or Lilith are triumphant after their separation, and perhaps in this, we can learn that man and woman can only hope for ruin if they are to turn against each other. To some, the inclusion of Lilith in the alphabet of Ben Sirah helps plug an old biblical inconsistency in the creation story of Genesis. The Bible tells us in Genesis 1 that God created life in a specific order. First came the plants, then came the animals, 
and finally man and woman were made simultaneously. We are told of this, so God created humankind in his image, in the image of God he created them, male and female he created them. Here we see that men and women are created together at the same time, and both are made in the image of God. However, in Genesis 2, we are given a slightly different account, where we are told that God had created man first, he who was Adam. Adam would precede both the animals and the plants, and was instituted to serve as a caretaker for these two creations. But over time, God deemed that man should not have been alone, and that man deserved to have a partner for which to help him in his duties. With this, we are told, so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. Then he took one of his ribs, and closed up its place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to man. As we can see in this version, woman is not created simultaneously with man, but instead made from man and presented to him. The problem with these two accounts is that it has spawned some debate as to which account was more true. Was woman created alongside man, or was woman created from man's side? Was woman created equally in the image of God as specified in Genesis 1? Or was woman created secondarily to help man as specified in Genesis 2? With every sentence in the Bible considered sacred amongst rabbinical communities, commentators would soon construct a series of midrash or stories to either bridge these two accounts together or provide some explanation as to why there was a disparity. With God seemingly creating woman twice, once in Genesis 1 and again in Genesis 2, there would have had to have been two women. The Bible tells us that this second woman was Eve, and this is readily agreed upon, but in order to warrant the existence of the woman in Genesis 1, Lilith was thus created. The Zohar or the Kabbalah, a work that focuses on the mystical aspects of Jewish thought, shares an interesting take on Lilith. In one idea, Lilith remains in the Garden of Eden after her dispute with Adam, and is actually present when Eve is presented to him. Upon seeing her rival cozying up to Adam, Lilith goes her own way and abandons the Garden. Whilst this may seem like a more mature notion, the Zohar treats Lilith virtually the same way as previous iterations. She is a seducer of men, a mother of demons, and a nocturnal predator. She is also likened even further to a succubus, where she is described as hovering above her unsuspecting victims in the night, and coercing them into spending their seed. Unlike a succubus though, Lilith appears to carry the child herself, infecting them with disease before birthing them into the world. The Zohar also adds a more sinister detail to the Lilith myth by partnering her with another demonic entity in either the demon of lust Asmodeus or the principal evil entity Samael. In some accounts, Lilith fornicates with Samael under the throne of God, so as to not only get back at Adam, but also to spite God in a most egregious fashion. In another account, the unholy scandal takes place after Lilith has already left the garden and made her way across the Red Sea. There she meets Samael, and they proceed to engage one another and produce several demonic beings that are unleashed into the world. In one variation, God becomes so concerned over the relationship between Lilith and Samael that he decides to take action. Fearing the two will create an overwhelming brood of demonic creatures, God castrates Samael, and this quickly dissolves their sexual relationship. In order to then satiate her sexual desires, Lilith is forced to move on to human males, where she once again adopts the role of the succubus by seducing them at night. In later years, both the popularity and curiosity of Lilith gradually rose, and both men and women appear to have kept the spell of her alive, though in rather different ways. By many of the European writers and artists of the 18th and 19th century, Lilith was still villainized, albeit inadvertently romanticized with her charms and beautiful appearance. The allure of this she-devil was able to inspire writers such as Johann Goethe and Robert Browning, those who found the name and character of Lilith 
too irresistible to not use in their stories. Given her profound beauty, Lilith was able to inspire artwork in a way few demonic beings have been able to achieve, including works by Dante Gabriel Rossetti, who even wrote about the Temptress. Rossetti describes Lilith as being scheming and spiteful, so much so that she conducts a plan to re-enter the Garden of Eden and cause man's downfall. She convinces the serpent, which some deduce was actually her former lover, Samael, to trick Eve into taking the first bite of the forbidden fruit. Because Lilith knew the way women would work, being one herself, she knew exactly how to manipulate Eve into ensuring her own downfall. She also knew how to manipulate Adam, having been the one who was created for him, and thus knew exactly the words the serpent would have to use in order to secure their downfall. In another version, Lilith actually takes the form of the serpent herself, to manipulate Adam and Eve against God. Once she has achieved her mission, she abandons the form of the serpent, and uses the creature as a scapegoat. Rossetti maintained that Lilith was evil, and noted that she did not possess a drop of human blood, though this did not stop him from painting her in the form of an appealing human woman perhaps either his appreciation of her, or as a warning to others to be wary of her. It should also be noted that Rossetti was not the only one to maintain the idea that Lilith had borrowed the form of the serpent to re-enter the Garden of Eden. Hugo van der Goes's Fall of Adam and Eve also depicts Lilith with the body of a serpent, as she appears to stand beside Eve, who acknowledges the forbidden fruit. Renaissance painter Michelangelo also had a go at painting Lilith as a half-woman and half-serpent hybrid that was wrapped around the tree of knowledge. In the fresco titled The Fall and Expulsion from the Garden of Eden, we can see this hybrid creature reaching out to Eve and handing her the fruit, which Eve readily accepts. Adam can also be seen searching for the fruit amongst the branches, but it's the interaction between the woman-serpent hybrid and Eve that interests us the most. As previously stated, Lilith knew the mind of a woman, because she was one, and so it's plausible to believe that she was able to form a connection with Eve that no other person could at the time. She was able to awaken in Eve her curiosity, her desire, her want for freedom, the very same things that Lilith had been admonished for. Eve was no match for the wiles of Lilith, hence why we see her here readily accepting the fruit, and Adam, who we see hungrily searching for more fruit, is no match for her either. In some ways, if this account is to be believed, by orchestrating man's downfall, Lilith may not have achieved the ideal freedom, but she certainly achieves the last laugh. As always guys, if you've enjoyed today's episode, then don't forget to give this video a thumbs up, and don't forget to subscribe for more content just like this. Also, don't forget to check out Crossout. Just use my download link here on screen, or click the link in the description below to access the game and an exclusive bonus. Until next time.